Hi, welcome to another episode of Start the Week with Wisdom. I'm your host, Bridget Burns, University Innovation Alliance. And I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed. Each week, I team up with Doug to have a conversation with a leader in higher education, and this week is definitely one of those, where we're going to be learning from one of the most important leaders right now in higher education in terms of forming policy and influencing the key decisions that are going to affect our students now and in the future. So the point of Weekly Wisdom is to provide you some inspirational, positive, uplifting conversation for the week ahead, to learn about someone's leadership and what they've learned through their journey, and hopefully give you a little bit of a boost to start you up on Monday. That's why we call it Start the Week with Wisdom. And as Bridget said, this is not a uh, college or university leader, but it's somebody who influences their work a great deal. Uh, joined by James Qual, who is the U.S. Undersecretary of Education, um, previously uh, spent a bunch of time in the Obama administration uh, in the White House, uh, and then in between worked for the Institute for College Access and Success, uh, which works on higher education uh, policy. James, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, we are super delighted to have you. And thanks for, uh, you said that this was your uh, podcast debut. So we feel very honored uh, to have I'm you join us. to be here. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just start out by uh, asking you a little bit about your style um, and of leadership and how it's been influenced by others. You have worked with, when you were domestic policy uh, deputy director, obviously worked with President Obama, but also Vice President Biden and many others, Arne Duncan. Um, and then also Antikas, out in the broader ecosystem, you've learned from a lot of folks and worked as a peer. I'm just curious about if you have any, uh, you've had an opportunity to work with some of these great leaders. Um, can you share any lessons or stories that have influenced your leadership style from them? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. I do feel very fortunate over the course of my career as worked with President Clinton, President Obama, President Biden, number of cabinet secretaries, senators, presidential candidates. And it's really been a privilege for me to see their leadership style and think about what works for them. Um, I think it's really important that everyone have a personal style that's authentic to them. Um, there's a many different styles as there are leaders. Um, but a couple of things that I admire and I try to em emulate, one is humility. And, you know, that was something, you know, that Secretary Riley, who's Secretary of Education, when I was 23 and started here for the first time, you know, really emulated. He made everyone in the room feel like they were on the team and uh, someone he respected and someone he counted on uh, for contributions. Um, a second thing that I really try to work on is clarity. And I think really great leaders, whether in politics or business or government, you know, really just know how to get their point across in very few words. And, um, you know, John Edwards, who I worked for, obviously was a very successful trial attorney, had this incredible gift to see one corner and he could sketch the whole picture or he knew just sort of the key fact that the whole issue revolved around. Uh, Ernie Duncan also just has a great ability to use one fact or one story um, that inspires people to feel like they have to take action. And then a third thing I guess I would say is a sense of responsibility toward the people that I work with. And um, I really want to make sure that, um, you know, when my team takes the time to write a memo or flags an issue that they think is important or they need help on, um, that they feel like I'm doing my job and giving them that guidance or that support or, or clearing away for them. That's something that, you know, President Obama was very, very good at. Um, you could tell just how seriously he took his job every night he would read his book even though sometimes he didn't get it uh right after dinner sometimes it came late at night and he'd come to the meeting the next day having read and put a lot of thought into it and i think that's really um an important part of the bargain that leaders have with their team is to make sure you're supporting them and respecting you know the contributions that they're trying to make I uh, really saw that with you. And I mentioned that the other day when we were prepping that uh, I remember one time in DC that we were having, it was, it was after some long day of conference and you were like, I got to go home. I got to go check my email. My team's been working all day and I need to not be a bottleneck. And I was kind of like, I get that. But I was like, but the rest of us are so tired. And yet here you were going to go do a second shift. So um, I thought that was an important um, insight into your style of, of leadership. Thank you. Yeah, I try. 
Um, the education department is one of those entities that is, um, I think, uh, easy to caricature sometimes and not all that well understood. And I guess I wondered what you think is, is most misunderstood about the department and the role you play. Yeah, good question. I mean, I think there's this idea that uh, the department, the executive branch has a lot of discretion and therefore it's easy. It's like easier to get change through the executive branch than maybe through Congress. And, uh, and then that leads to frustration when people don't see change happening at the pace um, that they would like. And um, it is true the department has a lot of discretion, but there's also a lot of people internal um, to the administration, not just across the department, but also across the government that need to agree for us to take action. Um, and a lot of that, a lot of those requirements are prescribed by Congress, um, public comments. And, you know, all of that, I think, is really for good reason. Um, the stuff we do is important. We have to get it right. Um, it benefits from people having a lot of different perspectives. Um, but it is, it is sometimes um, not easier necessarily than going to Congress. It can take 18 months to write a regulation that's moving pretty fast, actually. Um, our computer systems were really uh, designed uh, to um, for accuracy and uh, on a low budget. They're not necessarily very nimble. In fact, one of our biggest systems is uh, 47 years old. Uh, I'm 47, so I know 47 isn't old, but we are trying to replace the, uh, the computer system, hopefully not the undersecretary. That's great. I um, Well, I hope that's helpful because I do think it is uh, widely misunderstood and therefore people don't always know how to engage and support and uh, what kind of information you actually need from them uh, and what kinds of stories are especially useful when you're trying to advance change. Um, so, but I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, you've had this trajectory of uh, both, you know, working in the Domestic Policy Council with uh, Tikus and Ed, and obviously an extensive career, uh, politics and policy. And each one of these roles was very different. And from what I would, I would assume, took some different leadership style from you. And I'm curious if you can tell us how those roles have influenced how you are, are as a leader right now. Yeah, it has been interesting. Uh you know, uh, working on higher education and all those places, but the roles are quite different. And when I was at the White House, um, you know, a lot of my job was trying to give substance to the president's vision and his values for the country. And so how do we um, set policy priorities? How do we lift up work or ideas that uh, the teams are generating that are consistent with the direction the president is trying to take the country? It was also... I did a lot of translating. So it was a lot of helping uh, the lawyers understand the economist perspective or helping the comm shop understand the policy weeds. Um, it was a big part of sort of connecting the dots and helping people speak each other's language. Uh, as an outside advocate, you know, it's a little different. You sort of need to have a couple of things that you believe very strongly and plant a flag and find you know, new and creative ways to keep banging away at those points and um, stay relevant and try and keep your issue at the forefront. And now that I'm here at the department, you know, I'm really trying to support the secretary, support the president. I'm trying to make space for my team so that they have the guidance and the autonomy that they need to really drive their projects forward and try and produce results. So there are really three different, uh, three very different roles. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's helpful for me in my current role to have had those different perspectives because I have some idea of how um, the White House will think about a problem or the very different questions that a congressional staffer might ask, um, for example. So so that's really helpful sort of lead up to, to this question, which is which of the uh, pretend you're speaking to uh, some uh, Undersecretary wannabes out there who 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 could see, uh, uh, although maybe you'll tell us, maybe you'll tell them they shouldn't want the job. But um, uh, but assuming they, they do, no. what um, you know, what are some of the what are the key traits and characteristics that in the role you have are most important for you day to day uh, and over the long haul? 
Well, you know, I think there are a lot of different ways to do this job and there are a lot of different ways to do the job well. And um, different people are going to bring different things to the job. Um, I guess my advice would be to think about how do you have a, a team that together can do more than any individual can do. Um, and for many undersecretaries who come from outside of Washington, you know, how do you get uh, people who understand the programs and the policymaking process and the personalities? Um, for me, that's my background. Maybe I know too much about the details there. So while trying not to get into weeds, I'm also trying to um, find people who can compliment me, especially with experience working on college campuses, uh, people who know what it's like trying to do this work on the ground. You know, also people who have operational experience, data skills, communication skills um, that can complement some of my policy work. So, you know, for example, I'm really excited that President Biden chose Nasser Paydar uh, to nominate for Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education. And I just think his experience leading uh, a university doing the equity work on the ground is just a perspective that will be so important for us. That's great. I'm. Uh, I want to just ground us in this moment um, a bit more in terms of it's been a really challenging couple of years to be a leader, um, and it's it's sometimes challenging to just wake up and be a human uh, and and do a job right now. And so I'm just curious about you as a leader. How are you framing work? Uh, and when you communicate with your team and broader audiences, to uh, but in particular your team, uh, how do you help them keep their eye on the ball? It, rather be, than uh, being distracted by the various things going on in the world that, while important, they can't actually influence. Like, are there any words of of inspiration or perspective that you offer the folks who work uh, with you at the department? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's especially uh, for us, the challenge is that, you know, we are building a, a brand new team, basically. And um there's a heavy reliance on Zoom. We are in the office, um, but uh, some of our colleagues are not. Um, and so we do a lot of meetings um, over video and it um, doesn't uh, allow you to build the same sorts of personal relationships um, that meeting in person can do. You don't get the hallway time after to get a little work done. Um, you don't get the um, social experiences. Um, so it has made it a little bit harder for us to build the sort of informal capital that is so important to getting things done. I think what we try to do, um, we do try to take a little bit of extra time uh, to connect on a personal level and not jump right into business in every meeting. Uh, we try very hard to celebrate the successes um, that we're having. So, for example, we've um, discharged the debts of 700,000 borrowers, people who were cheated by their colleges, people in public service. And we see those stories, so we try to make sure that we um, call them to people's attention so that they can see the tangible impact of our, of our work. And um, we're also trying to make education an intellectually vibrant place to work. Like I want it to be a place that young people will feel um, excited, they'll be challenged, they'll learn things, they can make a difference um, in a way that's hard to achieve at, at, um, you know, at some other places. And just to remind folks, because I promised that I would put this plug, uh, the public service loan forgiveness, uh, the waiver that you all have issued is a really important piece. And I, in particular, um, I actually still need to file mine uh, to be able to make it so that Bridget. my, uh, <laughs> I know we talked about this. So this is opportunity for folks in the audience. I will put myself up there. Um, what, uh, what is the date by which people can get their loans that were not previously qualified for public service loan forgiveness? Uh, and is there anything else you'd like to share about that? Yeah, well, this program has been around um, for almost 15 years now. And the promise was if you work for 10 years in public service, you'll get your loan forgiven. And unfortunately, the fine print um, was pretty restrictive. You had to be in the right repayment plan. You had to have the right kind of loan. And uh, so it was a very complicated, confusing pro program. In a lot of cases, borrowers may not have gotten um, good advice from the contractors we hired to service student loans. So what we've been able to do is cut away a lot of that red tape. Say if you're making payments, if you're employed in public service, um, even if you didn't file the paperwork on at the right time, we can go back and give you an opportunity to, to restart. So the waiver is in place until the end of next October. Um, so I would encourage people to get started. Um, in some cases, you may need to consolidate your loans to bring them into the federal direct loan program. 
and that can take a number of months to um, uh, to process. Um, we also need to make sure we have your um, employer certified. And this is really for us. It's a first step. We want to make this program, you know, as seamless and as easy as possible. Um, we don't want this to be a program where only a small percentage of people who are eligible are actually benefiting. So we're looking at ways to try and automate this more going forward. That's great. And I love seeing folks on TikTok posting whenever they get their waiver and uh, yeah. we're surprised to do it. So I will do it. And uh, that is, I just, I, that was the official plug. I'll <laughs> check in. I'm going to check in on you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And actually just, you said next October, October 22, Correct. not 23. Okay. That's got correct. it. So um, you go to a little twist on the question Bridget asked a minute ago about your team. How do you, how are you yourself um, staying grounded and staying focused and and presumably the as upbeat as you probably need to be in your role and and so like on a particularly on a day where you're testifying in congress or you're doing something significant what are the 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 um what what do you do to try and keep uh in a good good frame of mind um i don't have one special secret i guess i think the things that help for me first of all i have a toddler and he does not care what's going on at work. Uh, he has a problem he wants me to solve, or maybe he's just in a now. So you, you right sort of. Now. <laughs> um, I think um, anything that I have to concentrate on really helps. So I really enjoy cooking. Cocktails are a hobby of mine. And the other thing that really helps is um, meeting people, who, meeting students, or people who are doing really great work serving students. And that is just really, for me, very refreshing and rejuvenating and kind of reminds me why we're, why we're doing the work and who we're trying to support and who we're trying to help. Um, so those are, the, I think, some of the things that I find very refreshing. And, um, you know, I wish um, that it was possible for more of my team to get out in the field than it seems to be right now. But hopefully um, in the coming weeks, we'll, we'll be able to do more of that. That's great. I, um, I'm going to shift to, um, you've had a, a very impressive career and you've been able to create a lot of impact in the world, but uh, I don't know what that's like for you. Um, having grown up as young James Squall, what is the most surprising thing for you when you look at your career? <laughs> uh, I don't know that it worked. <laughs> I didn't really have a plan, but I guess, um, looking back, it's incredible that I've had the opportunities that I've had. And um, it's just been, um, you know, a series of really, really rewarding and exciting um, opportunities. Uh, it's been a lot of work, um, but I, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have expected necessarily to have um, uh, gotten um, the breaks and the, and the support from people along the way that I found. Um, what um, we've got just a few minutes left, so I want to focus on some of the, the questions that we tend to ask everybody to get a sense of the of the uh, you know it helps to to give people that continuity. What what advice do you most consistently give to others who are thinking about leadership? Do you, uh, is there advice you've gotten that that you then pass on, or or how, how do you tend to to lead uh, give people guidance? Well, uh, when I was starting out, my dad, who's very reluctant to give me advice in general, he's, uh, but his advice was uh, to try and make your boss look good. And that, I think, was good advice. And it helped me remember um, what my job was and what my role was in the team, especially as a, um, as a junior person. I think uh, something that I try to emphasize now um, to my team is that you know, I think, I think all of us can work on our communication styles and it's not what you say, it's what they hear. Um, that's really important. So how do you simplify and shorten what you're trying to say and try and make this main point stick? That one's really, that's a solid, I've, I could get a t-shirt made based on that. Um, that's, that's really good advice, especially for folks early in their career. Um, I am curious about what has been, uh, what are you proudest of as 
a leader like that you've, you know, thus far. Um, I think of it as two kind of uh, sides of a coin is the, the, what you're proudest of and what has been the hardest thing you've had to do uh, in your career. Uh, well, the, I would say the hardest thing would be culture change. And I've been in situations where I stepped into organizations that um, were high performing, but you know, for whatever reason, just didn't feel comfortable for me in terms of my leadership style. And I think teaching a new culture and trying to evolve a culture is really, really challenging. It takes a very long time and can be taxing uh, personally. I think the things that I am most proud of is when, you know, I have had a team that I think is really fantastic and firing on all cylinders. And, you know, the group I have now, for example, you know, I'm unbelievably blessed to have a group that is brilliant and entrepreneurial and humble and supports each other. Um, and it feels like, you know, the best I can do is just try and nurture that and tend that and not get out of the and get out of the way of it. Um, and I find that just, um, you know, I find that very rewarding. I have a, a real sense of satisfaction in helping people do good work and helping people grow. That's great. Is there a particular uh, book that you have read on presumably on leadership um, that that helps you that has most influenced you and in your career? Well, I, one book I recommend a lot is How to Have a Good Day by Caroline Webb. This book was actually recommended to me by John Schnur of, of America Cheese, and I have found myself buying it for people. She takes uh, a lot of um, the scientific literature around um, psychology and communication and um, breaks down for you sort of the psychological aspects of why people may not be ready to hear what you want to say or sort of what might be going on in their heads as you're trying to communicate with them and literally just gives you like the precise words or the precise formula uh, for how to break down um, your message in a way that they may be able to hear. Um, she also has some good tips for leaders in managing their own emotions, um, which I think can be really helpful because if you're not calm and patient, you're thinking about, you know, the last meeting or, uh, you know, something else that didn't go the way you wanted to, then it's very hard to be present and supportive for people. That's a, I, no one has recommended that book before. So we are going to definitely nice. have to add that to the list. So um, that's solid. I, uh, I did want to ask, uh, you know, this is, you know, magic wand questions perhaps uh, might be magical thinking, but uh, I did, you know, you do sit in a space of, uh, of great importance and you've also been in the nonprofit space. You've, you've been around higher education for so long. Um, I'm curious if you, if you could maybe wave a magic wand and change one aspect of higher education, I'm curious what it would be and why. Um, this is like almost a policy question, Bridget, how <laughs> so change, change in pace here. Um, you know, I think our higher education system places far too much emphasis on a relatively small number of institutions that are very wealthy, very selective, very prestigious. We are very lucky to have those colleges and universities in the United States. They're an important part of our fabric. But if what you are trying to do is expand the middle class, promote equitable opportunity, help large numbers of people understand each other, you know, you've got to be looking at places like community colleges and public universities. Um, and, um, you know, that work really should be more prestigious than it is because that's the you know, those are the kinds of places that are um, changing people's lives, large numbers of people's lives, um, and are really driving prosperities of communities and regions. So um, so that is kind of my fear is um, places all seem to want to climb the U.S. news ladder, um, even when doing so um, could sacrifice what it is that their, you know, their community needs most. Well, we are certainly aligned about changing the value system of higher ed and what we prioritize and focus on. So I think that's a great way to end this conversation. Um, it's been really delightful to have this conversation with you. I know that you have uh, you, you get interviewed or you get you get to talk to a lot of different folks, but I wanted to make sure that folks got a chance to kind of peek behind the curtain in terms of your leadership style and how you think about the role. So I, I feel like we accomplished that today. So thank you for the time. And Doug, as always, thanks for being an excellent co-host. And for those of you at home, 
Uh, we will be here next week with President Freeman Rabowski from University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So we will see you same time, same place. And otherwise, we hope you have a wonderful week.